What Happens in the Woods is a true crime podcast. We discuss events that are often violent in nature. Listener's discretion is advised. State of Washington versus William Earl Talbot II, verdict form one. We, the jury, find the defendant, William Earl Talbot II, guilty of the crime of first degree murder as charged in Talbot. And do it. Verdict form two. We, the jury, find the defendant, William Earl Talbot II, guilty of the crime of first degree murder as charged in count two. In 1987, a young Canadian couple was murdered in Washington State. Jay Cook was just 20 years old and Tanya 18. For years, no one knew just who had done this terrible atrocity. Finally, in 2019, they not only identified the suspect with DNA and genetic genealogy, they actually took him to trial. William Talbot II was the man and he was found guilty, much to his apparent surprise. This was all thanks to the fact that the DNA from the crime scene was uploaded to the GED Match, the public genealogy website. Two second cousins of his were found, and the case was built from there. interest to trace their family history has grown in popularity over the past decade. By now we've all heard or seen of the DNA testing kits available that will trace your family history or break down your genetic makeup. Without knowing it, those popular genealogical testing kits are helping to change the face of modern crime solving. One case in particular made history in 2018 by the use of familial DNA as evidence to help finally solve a crime that have been long cold for decades here in Washington State. There is a huge debate on the legalities of using this technology. Who protects the privacy of those who have contributed? And who should be allowed to access the information? For the families that are getting answers to the unsolved crimes of their loved ones, it must seem a wonderful discovery. For the criminals who have gone nameless for so long, it must be a nightmare. Join us this episode as we discuss the landmark case of a murdered couple from Canada that has finally been solved, and so many others that are also emerging from the cold case files of years gone by. We'll also look at how the United States is handling the legal ramifications of using familial DNA in cases and investigations. This is True Crime Podcast, What Happens in the Woods, with your host, Justin Bryce. Let's get started. Well, welcome to episode six of our second season. So do you know, Bryce, there's a quiz. I lose. <laughs> no. Did you know that we're halfway through the season already? I didn't study for this test. <laughs> okay. Wow. All right. Well, time is just flying by yeah. while we're having fun over here. So yeah, 2020. All this fuckery over here. It's a lot of fuckery. So, yeah, we're halfway through our season. There may be some more fuckeries. We don't know. There may be. We had fun with the fuckery. So I, right off the bat, need to make an addendum to the last episode. Um, We're going to, we updated the references on the episode, but I neglected to include that I listened to a really good podcast that is called The Unresolved. They had a two-part series on... Misty Copsey's disappearance. We kind of did too. I mean, we kind of did too. Yeah, I'm not going to lie, but I, most of ours was just kind of conversation and just kind of where we wish that they had taken their investigation. Yeah. yeah. Still, still a lot of issues with that. Um, and we still may do another update. We're in the middle of reaching out to the liaison and would like to get more information about that case and about the other two girls the 14 year old girls that were murdered yeah and possibly the unidentified female 
So in in our case, the update that I kind of wanted to make or, you know, the correction that I wanted to make is that I had listened to that podcast and it wasn't necessarily information that I didn't know from my own research of Mm -hmm. things. I just really liked how he put things in perspective and and a lot of the information that he had, how he portrayed it. It was just a a good listen to. And um, of course, then there was the three part news series from Tacoma News Tribune, which I did list in the in the info. So everybody, you know, go check out the unresolved podcast. If you were into the Misty Copsey case and felt like we did, that it was completely bungled, you know, that that was a good podcast to listen to. Um, Side note, the, the head host got threatened on social media. I think it was Twitter by Corey Bobber, our friend with the awesome hair. (laughs) He threatened legal action if he didn't take the episode down. For Sweet. he was claiming like defamation of character. Fucking keyboard warrior. I mean, pretty much. I don't know. I I don't think it amounted to anything. I I'm the op- the episode is still up. I obviously listened to the episode yeah. recently, and this I think was like 2018. So I thought it was kind of funny that he was like, you know, my lawyer is more outraged about this than I am. And you need to take this episode down now. Or more and bark he, than bite. He was so much nicer, you know, regarding Corey. Yeah. I straight out came out and said, you're crazy. You're fucking Fruit Loops. Yeah. I said it and I don't, I'm not taking that back. So yeah, whatever. Any updates, Bryce? Australia. Australia is not an update. It's a country. Yes. Uh, Australia is number one this week. Yeah. A lot like a, a huge rise. So we love you guys. Oh yeah. Yeah. Any other updates? No, but I feel like we should have a class on discord. Yeah. I think we're going to have to do something a little bit. I, I don't know. Somehow make that just, I don't, maybe we can do a, I, how would you do that? You um, You just want to talk about it on a podcast or you want to, do you want to set out like a couple of slides on Instagram? Sure. I, okay. I'll figure out a way. Yeah, I feel like I, I'm not going to lie. It's it's not as user friendly as I would like it to be okay. for, for my level of comfort. <laughs> <laughs> there are different levels of comfort on there. There, are, yeah. I mean, it, you can just type and text on there. Uh, there, There is a mobile app. Uh, you can do it on your laptop, PC, Mac, whatever you have. But there's video chat, there's, you know, just audio chat also, or you can, you know, just go into the typing lobbies and just type away. Um, it, it, it was just for a place that we wanted everyone that, that loves true crime to come and, uh, you know, gather. We don't have to be on there. The server's always open. So if you guys want to find a room and a chat room and go into and or even have suggestions, because, you know, we're still looking for mods and, and admins and things like that. So if you want to apply, we're open. Yeah, I think um, I, I really the interaction that, you know, we're getting from people on social media, I'm I'm loving it. And I, I would like to see that kind of happen on the discord, too, because that's not just interaction with us. That's interaction that you guys can. With can the community. Yeah. Like you said we don't have to be on there. We try to get on there Friday nights, 8 p.m. Pacific time. And, you know, if, if we're on there, that's great. Please come and join us. If we're not, don't feel like you can't go and still look at it, look at it and check it out and make a post and see if anybody responds. You never know. So we also might have to change the time that we can go on. Especially now with the latest revelation, like Australia, I'm not too sure like what time it is. If we do it Friday nights at 8 PM, like what time it is there. Yeah. I I think that might have to be. Something that we have to look at, but or maybe we do it Saturdays yeah. afternoons. I don't know. Yeah, we'll we'll have to. Maybe we'll put out like a Instagram poll and see yeah. what days would work better, and if we do a morning or a night, or both, or both, depending upon our schedules. Yeah. All right. Well, there will be more then coming on on the Discord. Yeah. We're. We're still navigating it, so we'll we'll try to fine tune that and just make sure that everybody understands how to get on. I think that's maybe the main thing. Okay. Because it was, yeah, there's like a teeny tiny little except green button at the very end that I couldn't find for the longest time, and it's like at the very bottom of a page that you have to hit like a accept. Yeah, because you have to read the rule. Right, but it's like this teeny tiny little little itty bitty little thing. I don't know. Okay, I could probably make it bigger. 
I think you, yeah, if you can, I think that might help. It's just a reaction button. Right. But, you know, nobody can get in and chat if they don't know that that's what they're supposed to be doing. You should have read the rules. You know, look, (laughs) coming from somebody who doesn't read the instructions when they put something together. I don't need those. Those are guides. Right. They're just suggestions. You just answered your own question. Okay. But in the (laughs) server, there are rules. Okay. There are rules, yes, but the the fucking button at the bottom is tiny, okay? All right? <laughs> These aren't instructions. You're stressing me These out over rules. this, and I, I already am in there and on there. <laughs> All right. Any other updates, my love? No, honey. <laughs> okay. All right. So this episode, we're discussing something a little different. I have a case for you. I have actually a couple of different cases. Okay. They actually tie into something much bigger. And this is actually something that's a conversation um, that I think the crime community, not even just like on the side of lawyers um, or, you know, investigators, police officers, um, you know, anybody who does anything in regards to criminal activity, catching a criminal investigating a crime, processing that crime scene, any anything like that. This is a large, like a broad topic that is um, really has a lot of eyes on it right now. Yeah. We're talking about genetic DNA. Oh. So the crimes in particular uh, of this case that we'll discuss happened back in 1987, and they were only recently uh, solved with genetic DNA. And as I was looking into it, I, because the case that I'm going to discuss in particular is, um, it's kind of a big fucking deal and it happened here in Washington and it actually, when you look at the, you know, the, the factual information of it and the case and the trial, it's actually more important than the, uh, golden state killer trial and case. Oh. In in the respect of what it does for for the law and what it what questions it opens up, okay. so I will get to that. So as I was looking into it, it just it really brought up a lot of questions, concerns about legal rights of individuals, and um, you know how this technology is being used right now. We've touched on this a few times on the podcast. I think everybody, it's safe to say that everybody who listens knows that you know we're behind it. We're all for it. Yeah utilizing what means you have like this to solve a case that's cold and you have nothing else to go on. And then, you know, years later you get a hit on a DNA match from some second cousin somewhere. Yeah. You're, you're a criminal and you should know that you're going to get caught and this is how they're doing it. They're making it happen now. And I, I think it's great. I yeah. absolutely think that, you know, criminals, deserve to be caught yeah. and how they do that can mean many different ways. So we're going to take a deeper look in that, but we're going to start off by talking about the murders of Jay Cook and Tanya Van Kloyenborg. And they were a young Canadian couple who on November 18th, 1987 came down on the ferry from Victoria, Canada to Seattle's industrial district. And they were just down for a day on business. Um, they were, going to get on the ferry system, which we know that they did. They ended up here. They um, were driving Jay's family's like Ford wagon van. They made it to Seattle, picked up parts for his dad's furnace and heating company. The plan was they were supposed to drive back that day and be home the next day. Uh So when they never came home, their families reported them missing on the 20th. So two days later, two days. Okay. Yeah. So about a week after that, a female body was found in a ditch in Skagit County. And it, of course, it's not good. It's never good when you find a body in a yeah. ditch. Most of her clothing was off. Um, so it was obviously a good indication when investigators came across her that she had been raped uh-huh. or sexually assaulted in some way. Yeah. Um, she had been shot in the back of the head by what they suspected was a 38 due to just one single casing found near her body at the, on the crime scene. So they also found zip ties that had been presumably used to keep her restrained. Those were near her body as well, 
they had been cut off. But you could see where there was a few of them tied together, uh-huh. essentially, to make handcuffs. Yeah. Of course, they um, did process a rape kit, and they began to search to find the victim's identity. So there was nothing to identify her there. That, at the scene. At the scene. So a day later, there's a call into Bellingham police from a local tavern that they found some weird shit in their alleyway, which I would think, you know, a tavern's going to come across some weird shit. Yeah. So they find a pill bottle and a wallet in the back alley. That is how they find out their unidentified female that um, had been found a couple, you know, the day prior was Tanya. So okay. that was her wallet. That was her pill bottle. They found receipts in there. Um, that had the basically could account for the timeline of when they left Canada and when they reached their destination. Well, sort of reached their destination by getting to Seattle. Yeah. What is still unknown at this time to the investigators is who did this to her? Why? And after contacting her family, they start to question where the hell Jay is because until then they didn't even know to look for Jay. Yeah. And whether or not he was involved. Oh. And unfortunately, you know, when the investigators called to her family, they had to put that out there. Could he have done this to her? Yeah. And from all accounts, I mean, the kids were, they were in love. They were young. Um, I believe he was in his very early 20s and she was just barely 18. Mm-hmm. He was like 22, 23. Um, they were inseparable. And it was actually a kind of a joke that, you know, when they didn't show up, that uh, his dad, Jay's dad, kind of jokingly said, well, maybe they ran off and they eloped and mm-hmm. they're going to come home and it's a big surprise. Yeah. And so it's kind of sad, you know, to think of they had to roll it out. They had to roll out whether he was involved or not. Yeah. And I just I can't imagine like the family getting the news. Well, guess what? You know, we found your daughter um, and it's not good. And is there any way that this guy that she's, you know, madly in love with that you guys have accepted into your family could have done this to her? Like, it's just it's blow after blow, yeah. you know. So the police come out and they, you know, they start investigating this crime scene in the back of the tavern and they're looking around. They find some other things uh, that lead to m- more questions, not more answers. Most notably, they find car keys, they find rubber gloves and they find like a half used box of 38 caliber ammunition. Okay. They also find receipts for the ferry trip. And like I said, other, you know, receipts that prove their timeline of, of where they were. Mm. They can tell from that, that they got lost because after coming off the ferry, they actually went North instead of coming South to Seattle. So they ended up about an hour out of their way and had to backtrack. Okay. So all of this from the receipts, just from what they found in her wallet. Still no J though. For whatever reason, one of the investigators, as they're leaving the scene, catches notice of this Ford wagon van parked close. And at the time they weren't, they weren't sure what they were looking for. They just found these car keys. And I'm thinking probably because the car keys, you know, they have the emblem of the make on them. Yeah. And now everybody has a key fob, but even that it still says on your key fob what, what your make of your car is. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that, you know, that maybe just is something that's stuck with him. And so when he saw this van that was parked not far away, yeah. kind of caught his interest for whatever reason. You know, you sometimes you do things for, for whatever reason and it ends or, up being uh, just he, a, a he's gut been a feeling. Cop there, maybe he just it was out of place, something he hadn't right. seen. So yeah. Like it isn't big. I don't um, well, this was in Bellingham. Oh, Bellingham. Okay. Yeah. So I, it's still, I don't really know much about Bellingham. I'm not going to lie. I don't know exactly how big it is or not, yeah. but you know, for, for whatever reason it caught his eye and, mm. and it's a good thing it, it did. So he goes over and a quick, just a quick peek in the windows shows a fucking lot of blood. There's blood, a lot of blood. It's on some of the sleeping mats that were in the back of the van. Mm -hmm. There's a, you know, just a a glance around shows some things that are just odd. So, of course, everybody convenes on this van and starts Mm -hmm. processing it. And they find more zip ties that match the ones that were found by Tanya's body. Tanya's jeans that had seminal fluid on it. And then a few different types of cigarettes. And like I said, a lot of blood. Jay's body still wasn't found, though. Oh. 
So the body wouldn't be found for another day when a hunter and his dog are out uh, Thanksgiving morning. This is in Monroe, Washington. So this crimes like the the stretch of where their bodies were found and, you know, where this stuff was found at this tavern is like a radius of like 60 miles or something. Wow. It's they're not close. No. So the dog, you know, is out with his human and <laughs> catches the scent of something. And, he, you know, the guy's like, I, he just took off. Yeah. And once the owner catches up, he realizes that they found a body. And at first he wasn't sure that it was uh, a deceased body. Uh-huh. It was just a body that was wrapped in a blue blanket. So as he gets a little bit closer, he realizes it's not moving. You know, there's there's no sign of life there. And when the investigators come out and they start looking at everything, they do find that it was Jay and his body is so very badly beaten. It's unrecognizable. Oh, shit. It is really. Yeah, it's really not good. The way he was beaten and eventually died is is just horrible. It's really sad. There are a ton more zip ties around the scenes, just like the ones that were found in the other two crime, you know, the other two, the van and, and her scene, uh-huh. crime scene. So Tanya had been just shot, um, one shot in the back of the head after being um, attacked. Jay had been brutally strangled, beaten with probably a rock nearby. Oh. And they found a pack of cigarettes and a tissue lodged down his throat. Oh, They think probably to keep him quiet because as they're like, they, they go back and they try to piece out like who, who was attacked first, who got killed first. Well, in order to make Tanya probably compliant, Jay would have needed to been taken out first. Yeah. So unfortunately it would be confirmed that those items in his throat caused asphyxiation and that was his cause of death, his Uh leading cause of death. It is estimated that it took six minutes for him to die. Suck. I can't even fucking imagine. Yeah. It's absolutely horrific. So aside from the semen that's taken on Tanya's jeans found in the van and the rape kit that was performed on her body, the, and those two are a match. So it's the same, that's the same person. The only other bit of evidence that was um, found was a partial palm print on the back of the uh, van door. Uh Uh-huh. Not even fingerprints, palm print. There's really no good way to, to check that. Yeah. So it didn't help with leads. There's no suspect of the crimes. They, they've got nothing. It pretty much instantaneously goes cold. They really have nothing. Wow. And that was until 2018 when investigators sought help from a company called Parabon Nano Labs. So from there, as you're reading this, it reads like a, like a crime novel. Uh-huh. It's sensational almost. Yeah. Like you're reading in it and you're like, okay, this is some, uh, I don't know. Hollywood um, shit. Yeah, basically. <laughs> so the DNA that the investigators had been holding on to in hopes of like breakthrough technology, yeah. they sent that to Parabon Nano Labs to do what's called a composite. So from there, they can basically see your genetic makeup uh-huh. and would know whether you have green, brown, blue eyes, Yeah. Um, what color hair you would have. I mean, obviously not a haircut or anything like that. Do you have facial hair? You know, if you're a guy or, or a girl, they're not going to know that particular, but yeah. they can tell, are you Caucasian? Are you native? Are you, you know, are you European? Are you whatever? Yeah. Um, so from there they put out a composite sketch it didn't really go anywhere. Yeah. So then they also uploaded the DNA to what's called Jed Match. Uh-huh. That was on April 26, 2018. They got a hit pretty quickly that led them to two separate cousins that were genetically matched to the person who had left that DNA on Tanya. So by searching birth and mar- marriage records, they were able to find their guy um, that matched their DNA. So that was William Earl Talbot the second from Woodenville, Washington. And what it, what ended up happening is they found cousins on his mother's and his father's side Uh that, you know, were distant cousins and were able to just go back and with a genealogist, look through all these records Uh and pinpoint who he would be. So after that, police started shadowing him for a bit. They talked to some friends and family one of the second cousins ended up um, agreeing to 
have her information be used to, you know, positively to positively identify, identify yeah. him. And they were able to get, uh, so from shadowing him, he was a truck driver and he kind of pulled off the road someplace and gets out of the, you know, cab of his truck, uh-huh. paper cup rolls onto the ground. He doesn't pick it up. He does whatever he's going to do. He gets back in his truck and he drives away and yeah. police come in, they get that DNA cup and that's it. It's in, in a story. Don't litter, motherfuckers. Don't litter. It's there's dual purposes for everything. Yes. Yes. So they match it. They match it to the DNA that they have on file. It matches, you know, with the cousin's profile. So it's just a match all the way around. Yeah. They arrest him on the, you know, charges of murder for Tanya. And then they later added the charges of aggravated first degree murder for Jay. And he pled not guilty. He actually would not give them any information about the crimes. He gave them nothing. Yeah, because he's he wouldn't the only say witness shit. to it. The other right. two are dead. Right. So, and I'm sure that was his legal defense was like, oh, yeah. all they have is is this one thing. It's, it's not, they're not going to be able to convict you. So he pled not guilty, but he was convicted on both charges and he was given two life sentences. So he's applied for appeals because of the genetic profiling that, you know, was used as evidence, but he still sits in Washington state pen to this day. That's not been, a, you know, the appeals have not gone anywhere. So as I was saying, what is so important about this case is that this is the first time that using this technology actually gained a conviction as the only piece of evidence. I'm just going to, I was just going to say that that prosecutor was a fucking genius for presenting his case in a way that only that evidence led to a conviction. Yeah. And in front of, you know, uh, in front of jurors, you know. Right. So, I mean, that was something that I have like a quote for, because it, it kind of, when you put it into perspective, like, and I'll kind of get into that in a little bit. When you think of the evidence needed to go to trial, and there are certain, there's just certain things that have to be met. There's certain requirements with that evidence, with what you have to even, you know, bring a person to trial for crimes. Yeah. You have to be able to prove in some way that this happened. All they had was this match on Jed match mm-hmm. that proved that he was related to this cousin that, you know, was genetically linked to the DNA that they found. Yeah. That is extraordinary evidence to prove I mean, it's, it's scientific. It's there. Anybody who follows, you know, any basic biology knows that that's how that works. But to prove that in a legal way to say his DNA was there, these people, these people died. It, you know, here's, here's the link. Yeah. He had to convince those 12 people to convict that guy. Right. And the thing with his, you know, his defense was, well, you know, yeah, he could have had sex with her. It probably was consensual though, yeah. because on the information, you know, the, what they got back from her rape kit uh-huh. was that she also had bodily fluids. So they were saying that she was aroused uh-huh. and that couldn't possibly be rape because she, she was participating. So it was consensual sex. I highly doubt it. And obviously you don't know the way that your body works. That's, that's actually a defense that your body is trying to make the, the rape like lessen for you. But, um, that aside, she was actually menstruating when this happened, they found a used tampon in the van. So I apologize if that makes anybody uncomfortable, but I don't know a whole lot of women who are like, yes, please let me have sex with somebody that I don't know while I'm on my period. Yeah. I, I, I just, in my mind, I'm sorry, I don't buy it. So the bullshit, you know, Oh, it was consensual. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. And she ended up dead. Yeah. So how consensual could that be? And traveling with her fiance, basically. Right. I mean, they were very much from all accounts in love. And I can't see that that would have happened. I can't see that they would have separated it. This wasn't like a pleasure cruise. They were down here on business and going back the next day. So the fact that, you know, they may have found somebody in a bar and did what had a threesome. I don't think so. I don't think so. 
Yeah. So it is very much though a landmark case because of that. So when I was looking at that, this is the first time that was done in the U.S. and it was successful. This oh. is the first time that that has happened, and the first time it's happened and it was successful. Like it was, it's not like it had been a tried and attempted mm-hmm. and not successful. This is the first time that it happened and it was successful. Oh wow! So I read an article on Wired online that stated this, and it's quote: "We didn't know whether juries might be skeptical of evidence the police came about through this means, or whether they think that maybe it was a problematic investigative tool." And that's from um, Andrea Ross. She's the director of UC Berkeley's Center for Law and Technology. Another part of it states, the main thing this teaches us that we didn't know yesterday is that you can convince a lay jury to convict someone found as a suspect through genetic genealogy. And that's pretty fucking spectacular. Yeah. So this leads us, you know, kind of to what DNA is, um, the genetic DNA and how investigators are using it and what it means as far as, you know, new laws that need to be enacted, um, to, to be able to use it, you Mm -hmm. know, enacting these laws, it's going to happen eventually. There's not much now, but it's going to happen where they're going to have to get very serious about how this is used and how it's obtained and what they're doing with it. So I definitely am not a scientist, (laughs) I, I, I'm not a math person. I'm not a science person. It's not my thing. So I know enough to know enough kind of, you know, basically. So when I was looking at how best to put this information, I came across something um, on the national conference of state legislatures website and it, it put it together, but it was simplified enough that I felt this is probably the best way to just say this. So this is from their website. When a DNA sample is analyzed, a DNA profile is created that identifies DNA sequences at 13 specific locations. Each person, except for identical twins, has a unique DNA profile. When a match is made to a profile already in a DNA database, it means that both profiles share identical DNA sequences at each of the 13 locations. If a profile is compared against the database and does not identify an exact match, it may show profiles that share enough similarities to indicate that they belong to a related individual. This is a partial match. Actively searching for these family relationships through statistical analysis software is called familial DNA searching. So I normally would not like quote huge paragraphs from from a website. That's not what we're about. I just couldn't have said that any better. Like there was, there was no way for me to put that better so that it made sense. It sums it up. It basically, yeah, it did a, a better job than I could. So we know that DNA testing has been huge in helping connect criminals to their crimes, just like fingerprinting was. It's pretty much, you know, that, that big of a deal. Um, but both of those depend on having either DNA or fingerprints on file within a system database like CODIS. Yeah. With familial DNA, they can go the step further and use genealogical DNA profiles that are in GEDmatch. So how do they get to GEDmatch? Well, this is where those like kits, those 23andMe kits or Ancestry.com come into play. And it's it's newer idea of let's trace where your family came from and let's do this, you know, this kind of emerged in the late 90s, early 2000s where it was the newest big hobby to everybody search their genetic history and your lineage and know where you were found. And now, I mean, you can find these kits to test your DNA. You're like to see what kind of medical problem you might have or, you know, be susceptible to, or just to know like what your ethnic background is. Uh You can find them everywhere for like a hundred bucks. I actually found one, I think it was on an email that I get. It was like Brad's deals or something, you uh-huh. know, that shows you all those deals. $47 for one of these kits. We're not endorsed by Brad's deals. No, we're not. <laughs> and I'm not even saying everybody go out and get one of these kits. And well, we might discuss, you know, why yeah. in a minute. But um, it, yeah, they're accessible as where, you know, this is technology that you couldn't even, you couldn't even do this. 20 years, 30 years ago. No, it's just no. not even a thing. So these are like mostly geared 
to finding potential relatives or, like I said, your ethnic makeup by using three different ways to test. There's um, autosomal DNA, Y DNA. Those are found in the chromosomes. And then there's mitochondrial DNA, which is found in a cell. And that's only passed from mother to child. So you can only search that from mother to any child. Um, Y DNA, you can only search in a male. Then, you know, from there, it, it gets processed accordingly. So these kits are so popular that according to the genealogical DNA test Wikipedia page, as of 2019, there's an estimated 26 million DNA samples, unique DNA samples that are on, you know, like on file with these companies. Wow. Right. It's a lot. Yeah. So naturally, there's going to be huge concerns about how this information is going to be used. And the counter argument that always is brought up is is very basic. And it, that's that it's bringing answers to unsolved crimes. Yeah. It, you know, you if you wouldn't have done the crime in the first place, there'd be nothing for you to worry about. No. But there again, you know, there's a privacy issue with with some of these it's not like the criminals are submitting their own DNA. No. So, you know, how how this gets accessed is yeah, that's that's something to to think about. And yeah, I'm already screwed. So if I've committed a crime, <laughs> my sister and my father have both done it. I don't know who else has done it. I don't know if my brother's done it, but I know my sister Renee and my dad have done it. (laughs) I don't think anybody in in my family has done it that I know of. I mean, I know our, like Mara wants to do it. Our oldest, she's wanted to do it for a few years now and for whatever reason hasn't, but it may be just the money. Yeah. They're not that expensive though. Like she, she was like, Oh, I, I, if you get me one for Christmas, yeah, I, I was always like, yeah, I don't know if I want to get you one for Christmas. That just <laughs> seems silly to me. So we're going to discuss some of these crimes um, that have been, you know, unsolved for years and are now getting a lot of attention and breakthroughs when we come back from our break. We've talked about this a few times during the what the fuck episodes about how cold cases were getting answers recently because of DNA technology. So very recently, our last what the fuck episode, we were talking about a couple different ones. So there was the murdered victim of David Roth, who after 40 years was identified as Elizabeth Elder Roberts uh, from Oregon. Mm -hmm. We talked about that in our first season, that episode with the murdering Roth brothers is what it's titled. At that time, when we were discussing that, we didn't know who who his victim was. He didn't know who his victim was. He had actually been trying to help police find who his victim was. Yeah, I remember that part. Yeah, based off of him, because there was so much, uh, you know, deterioration to her body when they found it, and how he had killed her by shooting her. Her profile was not, like, her, her face was not recognizable. Yeah. So he had actually talked to a sketch artist and was the one who was able to provide them along with the, you know, the sketch artist that does composite sketching off his skulls. So, you know, his help with that, like what her hair color was, the haircut that she had, what she had been wearing, he was trying to help. But 40 years later, still unidentified. And that episode that we talked about, the what the fuck episode, they um, had identified her. And it was using, you know, DNA technology like that. Then we also, that same episode talked about the body of Rodney Peter Johnson that was found uh, floating in Stickney Lake in 1994. And he had gone missing from like 1987 and had remained unidentified until this summer. And both of these cases, like I said, used familial DNA to under, you know, uncover the victim's identities. It, it's something that after 40 years, I don't think anybody would expect you're going to get an answer. No. it's. I mean, that's a long time to go as a Jane Doe. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Recently, of course, uh, it was used in California. And that's how they found the Golden State Killer, Joseph D'Angelo, which I think the entire planet is been, you know, has been following that case. I don't think there's anybody in true crime or not true crime that doesn't know about that. Because it's sensational. And I mean, he was up and down the entire state with his crimes. Yeah. 
Before that, though, it had actually been used in Los Angeles area to find uh, Lonnie David Franklin Jr., who is known as the Grim Sleeper. And in that case, it was useful to find a suspect. But there was other, other evidence that had been found that they had to use in his trial. So they didn't rely solely on the genetic DNA. They were relying on that to identify him, but they had then other, there was like hundreds of photos that they found of victims, potential victims or women um, at his home. Oh, He had murdered, uh, I believe it was 10 women. They ha- He had photos of those murdered women in his home. Yeah, that'll scree every time. Yeah, so they didn't need to rely on the DNA evidence. They just needed it to catch him, to yeah. find him. So he had been terrorizing South Los Angeles from 1985 until 2005. And it was mostly women of color that he murdered. There was one white woman. They were not, I mean, the it, it just wasn't a big deal. They yeah. weren't, you know, getting the information out there because this is women of color that were were being murdered. And when they finally started putting two and two together, it stopped. So he was actually found when his son was arrested for a firearms charge and they collected his DNA. Okay. And then they matched it to uh, Franklin, you know, to his DNA that mm-hmm. had been found on the victims. So your son gets arrested and fucked you up, yeah. basically. <laughs> Um, In the case of Joseph D'Angelo, his pleading guilty got him straight to sentencing. So there was no trial. So they did not use the genetic DNA and never got a chance to be debated in court. And it's quite possible that that they would have needed to do that. They would have needed they they didn't really have much, but they did have victims that came forward that, you know, could testify. So they had something. Mm hmm. But they might have needed to use that genetic DNA. They just didn't, they didn't ended up not needing to because he went straight to sentencing. Yeah. And then I also read like cases in Virginia have been using this. Um, When I looked into was an unsolved rape case in 2016, the suspect was holding the victim by gunpoint, assaulted them and got away with it and was never caught. And in comes, you know, genetic DNA and they find a good match through Jed match, which leads to finding the suspect. And he was trying, his defense team was trying to make the genetic DNA inadmissible for trial. And I just can't imagine being, you know, putting yourself in the victim's shoes. I cannot imagine being able to face your accuser, know that that's who it is and know that they may not get punished for the crime because this could be thrown out of court because of that. Yeah. It's. I think that would be incredibly frustrating. And where's the justice in that? Yeah. I mean, your DNA is on this person. They've collected it. She's still alive. She's not murdered. But you did rape her. Yeah. And you left basically you left your mark. Your mark. Yeah. And it's. It could. You know. Go to nothing. It could amount to nothing. Which would be. I. I could imagine just the frustration that could come of that. One of the craziest ways that this has been used, aside from GSK's case, was to finally correctly name the Boston Strangler. I didn't even realize that this was up for discussion. Yeah. I thought that this was already a a known, like the suspect had been known. I really didn't know that in 2013 that this has presumably been solved. It's, It's done. So... This is actually uh, the Boston Strangler was something that interested me because I couldn't imagine why these women were letting this strange man in their apartment. Yeah. You live alone. You don't let fucking men in your apartment that you don't know. Nope. What the hell? I mean, even in the 60s, especially in the 60s, why the fuck would you let somebody in your house? And it it kind of stuck with me. I guess I've always been paranoid. I guess that's what that means. <laughs> that's always been my thing. I don't know. You get the fuck away from me. Yeah, I know how that is. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I don't play. I don't. If I don't know you, don't come and, and talk to me. Yeah. I didn't inv- invite you into my circle. Yeah. You are not in my safe space. I don't know you. You can get the fuck away. Okay. Okay. I know you now. I like you now. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> you you gotta you gotta prove yourself to me first, and then I might let you in my safe space. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. 
Sorry, not sorry. Okay. Hey, it's kept me alive and safe. Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah. So don't bitch too much. Okay. <laughs> So the Boston Strangler goes back way back to the 1960s. There was 13 women that were raped, strangled, and murdered in their apartments, all in the same MO. And I was under the impression that they knew that it was Albert DeSalvo this whole time. Mm -hmm. But he just, for whatever reason, did not get you know tried for these crimes. So there is a nephew who gave a DNA sample and it was a match to the DNA that was taken from the last known victim who was Mary Sullivan in 1964. I'm just picturing in my mind, the freezer that's holding DNA from the sixties. What does this freezer look like? What, <laughs> like, yeah. what else is in this freezer from 1964? <laughs> and, and, you know, where did they even, oh, let me uh, get get behind, you know, let me start searching through the freezer to pull out the DNA sample from 1964. I just sitting chilling, waiting till it's tested. Yeah. I, it's pretty cool to think about, but it just kind of got me picturing one of those old Frigidaire refrigerators that you had to defrost every month. Yeah. Yeah. So what always had confused me about this case, too, was that the killer had confessed, but nobody believed him. So Albert DeSalvo confessed to committing the crimes after being arrested for rape, for unrelated charge. Mm. And he was already in jail. He was awaiting trial. They entered a plea of not guilty by reason of insanity. And his lawyer even brought up the confession as a way to confirm that he was crazy. They were basically like, this guy is so nuts that he confessed to a crime that we don't think he did. Yeah. And the, he, didn't, he just raped her. He didn't kill her. Well, he, yeah, he didn't get that far. He, well, he raped, yeah, this victim. He was on trial for that. But, mm -hmm. and there again, what's the, what, what motivated him to not, did he get interrupted? Did he not want to kill this woman? Like there's, I mean, obviously leaves questions and yeah. I, I, we're never going to get those answers. But the lawyer basically says, that's a nice try, but it, that, that is an unrelated case. Yeah. And it doesn't tie into this case, so we can't hear anything about it. It's inadmissible. Yeah. So the detectives admit that he had good knowledge of the crimes and the details, but he he got some of the key facts wrong. Like he got some of the key um, important information. He got it wrong. Hmm. And for whatever reason, there's just no follow up to investigate him. And you know, if he had really done these crimes. And I guess his family had finally had enough of all this and they started to try to clear his name because yeah. he was still associated with it. And that was in 2000. Well, in 2013, you know, the, the nephew decides to submit to one of these tests and there's a, a match in Jed match. Wow. In 2013. So if, you know, going back to the sixties, if this can happen, what other crimes can we solve? They, they, you know, there's some DNA waiting because in the 60s, they didn't know no. to save that. I Whoever had the presence of mind to do that is a fucking hero. Yeah. But it confirms that that's that was him. It doesn't convict him of the crime. He's already passed away. Long time oh. passed away. Um, his family is still saying that he couldn't have done those things and um, denies that they that they, you know, they basically are saying our stance on this. And I don't know about the nephew who submitted his DNA to Jed match, but the family essentially is saying there's no way that it's him. And we're going to deny that it's him. They even have a team of lawyers working to clear him. Even though he admitted to it. He confessed to it while in jail and his DNA is a match. So, you know, you take, Talks I guess, like that duck. information. Talks like a duck. I just would think that you, you would try at least a little bit to investigate that. At least a little bit. You would think so, too. Yeah. But, but it, then we just did a case on Misty Copsey. And <laughs> that's true. But in this case, I mean, this is a high profile. Even at the time, that was high profile yeah. case. To say that you don't have anybody to look at. Or to say that you had somebody to look at and didn't look at them uh -huh. makes you look incompetent either way. Well, also, I think this was before the profilers, right? Before the FBI. Oh, yeah, profiles. way before that. But the, it, 
all of these women were murdered the same way. Yeah. They were all single women. They were all murdered with their own pantyhose. They were all raped. They were all strangled with those pantyhose. Yeah. They all were, you know, single that lived alone. The only thing that varied was their age. He didn't give a fuck. He was as much for young as old. But you just had to live alone. But you had to be a, a single woman that lived alone. Hmm. And, you know, it, there was very much that was the same in all of those. Yeah. I I don't think it would have taken a profile to um once you had somebody that confessed to it. I don't think it would have taken a profile from FBI to put two and two together. No. I just yeah, I think it was there and they for whatever reason it just was not looked at. And I really am interested to kind of go back and reread that cuz I I remember looking at that as a 13-year-old. So that's probably something that I would want to go back and reread and then, you know, relook at this DNA. But when I saw that, it did really stick out to me because that was something that I had been interested in. So when we look at all the science has accomplished, what what's wrong with using it, right? If these people hadn't committed crimes in the first place, we wouldn't have a problem. There's just this debate that there is a chance that this can be used and the margin of error may cause a person to be accused of a crime that they just didn't commit. And it's a very small, small percentage, but it's there. Yeah. There's especially a concern for people of color who are already not getting treated fairly. They're already, you know, profiled in certain ways. They're already, it, it, it's just, it's already an issue. So if you can take this now and it's, it gets used and it's twisted and it's wrong. Could you convict somebody of a crime? But we say we have the science backing it up. If the science is wrong, we're convicting the wrong person. But, you know, how likely is that to happen? I don't know. Yeah. I I just don't. I don't think so. Either. I mean, it's a match. If it's a match, it's a match, you know. Right. But whether you're there, wrong place, wrong time. It, for sure. Yeah, it's I, up to the police or the prosecutor there. to prove that you were beyond a reasonable doubt to a jury of your peers. Yeah, no, I I do agree. I mean, I from what I know of DNA, it's not like you can fake it. It's not like you can, you know, you can leave somebody else's DNA though if you've collected it. Yeah. So in that respect, it it could be used. You know, you can you can do that. The thing that that I think to me was kind of a red flag is that there are significantly less black, Hispanic and native people's DNA in these databases. There is like such a small pool. Most of this is predominantly white. Yeah. So are they going to start trying to match for somebody who's not white and they're going to come up with nothing. So then they're going to be like, well, let me start, sh- let me start getting other things. Uh-huh. So how far are you willing to, to reach to get your match? That's kind of the question. Like how far are you willing to go to try to put DNA into Jed match so that you can match your DNA and make it, make it match what you've collected from a victim or something. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know that you can do that. Well, Anybody can submit a DNA like the 23 and me. Yeah. It's a swab. Yeah. So what if somebody gets arrested? They take a swab and they send it in and now all of a sudden it's in Jed match and then they could say, "Oh my gosh, look, we've caught the perp." Uh-huh. I don't know. I I think there are ways that it could be used if you're smart enough to outsmart the the process. Yeah. I don't know. So one I mean one article I read stated that there were trials that connected distant cousins incorrectly and listed them as siblings. So I don't know if that's because of human error or if that was because the science was incorrect. That's the other thing. If humans are in charge of this, humans are going to be full of errors. Yes. That's just, we're, we're not perfect. So there are some issues. I think according to um, one article that I read on line with Harvard university, something else that concerns me is that information can be uploaded and accessed without warrants. And that's just across the board currently in the United States. 
So while you're putting your information out there on a website, you're paying to get entry to that website for the purpose of learning your lineage. The FBI can come knocking, take that info to connect you to some, you know, long lost cousin that you don't even fucking know. And they could have committed a rape 20 years ago. And again, they committed the crime. That's not disputed here, but now you're connected to it. Mm -hmm. So what's to say that they're not going to try to connect you for something else? Yeah. What if they're saying this was an accessory crime? Are you accessory? Do they need a second person for some reason? And hey, they found you to find them. You're there. I don't know. So the U.S. is kind of addressing this state by state. There are numerous states that aren't waiting for federal ruling on this. And they're enacting their own procedures on how to use this info um, for, to name uh, just a few, Colorado, California, Texas, and Virginia. Familial DNA is only being used when they just can't get any other leads or they've exhausted all their other resources. Um, There are also some hiccups in using it as evidence because according to the Sixth Amendment, you have the right to be, quote, confronted with the witnesses against you or them, end quote. Um, If this lab report is evidence, which is what they're saying, then the person who oversaw its conception and accuracy would be considered a witness. So multiple states are enacting requirements that the lab workers have to go to to court and testify as a witness over the lab resort results. Uh Um, Some of them are saying, no, it can be a recorded conversation between, you know, as long as the prosecution and the defense can both question this person, that it can be recorded or they could do like a video call. And that's, it's different across the board. There's not every state is doing the same thing, but currently there are no rulings in the Supreme court on the matter of the testimony. And it's, it's probably going to be something that they're going to have to start looking at, which means that they're going to start having to rule on using this type of technology with, as evidence. Um, Something I found really interesting was that in the UK, genetic DNA has actually been used going far back as 2004 in cases. They're on it. They're a little more progressive when it comes to that because, you know, I mean, if you look, they've had cameras for forever over there before we had them here. And that's kind of like we we trail behind them in in some aspects. And I think, you know, we get a lot of our precedents from them you know like look they they have cameras anywhere you go in london you're going to be on camera basically what it is you know they can follow you down the street and connect you to a different camera and they can basically follow you around the whole city right with that um but that just doesn't surprise me that they've been using dna yeah, or no. genetics for you know quite some time before we have no i i wasn't quite um i thought it, like i said it was interesting i wasn't quite surprised at it because i i think in america we're constantly like don't tread on me don't yes. you know what i mean don't yeah. infringe upon my rights and and that's fine i'm not saying that that's wrong mm-hmm. there it's there for a reason um but in other countries that are more established because we're still we're we're still young yeah. for a country in other countries that are more established they definitely have some more progressive views on those kind of things. But also I feel that in, especially in the UK, they're set up a little bit differently as where we're set up of every individual has rights. Mm -hmm. They're more of the, the group has rights. Yeah. The group has a greater good. It's a smaller continent for them. (laughs) Yeah. I just, they have a different attitude towards that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, they they definitely have been using this. The first case they actually used it on was just a petty crime. Mm-hmm. And it was just kind of to see what they could do with it, I think. They found a person that threw a brick at a car from standing on top of a bridge. And and they found DNA on the brick. And they found this guy. And he was like, yep, I sure did. And confessed to it. And it was, I mean, it was just a petty crime. It wasn't even like he murdered somebody because the car got out of control. Yeah. There was no prior criminal history, but a family member had DNA in the system and then the dots were connected huh. and he confessed. He was like, yeah, I, I did. Um, since then, it has been reported that the use of genetic DNA has been used over 200 times to link suspects to crimes throughout the UK. So they they obviously have no re- like little little reservations to use it in appropriate situations. They're not just out there using it for everything. I mean, 200 crimes Considered to what they have as yearly crimes, I'm sure that's a tiny, minute fraction of of what 
they could possibly use it on. So I, I do feel that they're just, you know, reserving judgment of when to use it. It's not just out there to use for every case. But, you know, as we know, there are high profile cases here that are getting solved with it. We're using the technology. We just don't have any laws, too many laws in place now of how far we're going to use it. Like yeah. how far are we going to go with it? Um, but what I, I kind of thought was odd was Canada has yet to authorize it. Period. They have not, they won't use it. They won't? Mm-mm. Well. Which I, given their Mr. Big scheme. <laughs> yes. That we, uh, we did that story, the Ruffet family murders yeah. in the first season. Mr. Big scheme, I, it was some bullshit. Sh- <laughs> just some bullshit. I and, call shenanigans. Yeah. And for them to not use like science backed technology yeah. to pr- catch a criminal, but they set up a sting operation that is just highly suspect like to a, catch young you know, teenage boy criminals. Like a big movie production. Oh my God. I mean, the amount of time that went into that was, yeah. I mean, they were like scripted and oh, shit. So, I mean, what are your guys' thoughts? We want to have a conversation on this. I'm I'm really interested to, to see. And like I said, I'm not a scientist. I might've got some of this information wrong. I did the best research that I could, but I definitely have, you know, like I said, I know enough to know enough and I can see where there's an, an argument on both sides. Yeah. You know, I, I can see that there's definitely an argument on both sides. You and I are not opposed to using this technology and no. catching criminals. Like we've just said that. It's plainly. too late. Too late for me. My sister and my father Stop have already it. ruined it. You, but what have you done? <laughs> nothing. <laughs> Yet. I, I admit to nothing. Nothing. Yeah. I mean, I haven't, I'm not worried, but there again, I am not rushing out there to add my DNA to these databases yeah. just because there are not enough safeguards in place to make sure that, you know, it yeah. is going to be used appropriately. I know that I can access it, but it's just like HIPAA. That's my medical family yes. genetic information Mm -hmm. that I just don't want everybody to fucking have. Yeah. Not that I've committed a crime and got, if anybody in my family committed a crime and got caught because I submitted, you know, DNA to jet match. Well, you're a fucking idiot. Yeah. Cause you know, I'm not going to stand behind you if you've committed a crime. You're, I'm not the person to call if you need a body hidden. Like, I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm, I'm going to rat you out because I'm not going to fucking jail for you. Yeah. I love you. And I will come visit you all you want. I will try to smuggle you in some shit, but I ain't going to jail for you. You put it in your prison wallet. Sure. I, why not? (laughs) If that's what it takes, Uh, I'm, I'm going to be here for somebody, but I'm, I'm not going (laughs) to, I'm not going to jail. Yeah. I'm not going to jail. I'm sorry. I, I don't, there's aside from like the girls and maybe you, I don't think I could go to jail for anybody. I really don't. I don't know if, if, if somebody heard my dogs, maybe, maybe I'd go to jail, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not trying to submit my DNA to, to one of those tests just, just because I don't, maybe at some point I might, but I don't feel that there's enough safeguards there and it's not covered with HIPAA privacy laws. It's Mm -hmm. not obviously if you can access it without a warrant, it's, it's not covered by that. So someone hurt my dogs. I would just call Uncle Tito. (laughs) <laughs> we need we need your help Kuya. uncle tito yes oh well so yeah if anybody wants more information on jay and tanya's case uh there is a canadian series that i watched called the fifth estate and you can find it on youtube so it didn't cost me anything to watch it i watched a few of the episodes and it actually has like a real um older unsolved mysteries vibe yeah, they're probably trying to recreate that. They're doing it in a good way though. Yeah. I'm not gonna lie. They they they're doing it in a good way and it was it was good to watch. So I I actually watched like five episodes in a row that had nothing to do with with uh Jay Cook and Tanya. So you got sidetracked. Koy and Bur- Borg. I did. <laughs> I did get si- hey, but it's all research, right? Sure. It all helps me. Yeah, if that's yeah. what you want to call it. Yeah. Whatever helps you sleep at night, honey. Well, there's a lot that helps me sleep at night, but this ain't that kind of podcast. Oh. 
So I I recommend watching that. It's, it was really worth um, watching if you, you know, if you got the time. No matter the controversy that surrounds familial DNA being used as evidence, these families, they got answers. And I think that the knowledge that the person responsible for the crimes was found and is paying the price is worth whatever the controversy is, honestly. Yeah. Well, it's already out there. Right. It's just like anything else, any other evidence. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I, I feel like once you start t- talking like science, there's a science to things. It, it's not disputable yeah. <laughs> so much. So as always, all the information I used is going to be linked in the description on the episodes when we, um, you know, and of course on our website, but uh, don't forget, we're going to be on the discord server tonight. <laughs> Yes, 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And again, I want to mention that we're really having some great interactions with listeners. And I I love it because yeah. that is exactly what I wanted. Um, other podcasts and listeners. And I love, you know, seeing private messages from you guys suggesting things to me. Um, I got a book suggestion today. So I'm all for it. I love it. And keep it coming, you know, interact with us however you guys want to. Yeah. However you want to. We we definitely, and it's me answering. It's not, I mean, if you get an answer, it's me, it's Bryce. <laughs> we don't have a PR team. We don't have a PR team. It, it is us. Um, and, you know, I try to be as thoughtful when I respond as, as possible. So I, I hope that nobody thinks I'm being like abrupt, but we both work full-time jobs too. This is definitely not our, our full-time gig. So as much as I would love to be able to sit on the computer all day and research nothing but true crime yeah. and just make this my job, it's not. Um, so, yeah, I I just want you guys to know that that's meaningful interaction for me. And um, I, I love it. So keep it keep it coming. As always, we want to thank you guys for listening and thank you for joining us, keeping this going and, you know, just letting us know that we're doing a good job. We, we really appreciate that you guys think that we're doing a good job. So until next time, everybody be kind, please. And stay out of the woods. Stay out of the damn woods. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. <laughs>